Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organization defending women's sexual rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There is more information on the website womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our Declaration on Women's Sex Based Rights, which has been signed by 30, uh, 32,912 people from 159 countries, and it is supported by 463 organizations. We have over 100 volunteer activists, including 53 country contacts, engaged in defending women's rights. Thank you very much to our donors who make these webinars possible to cover costs of the Zoom, emailing platform, website, video editing, and other admin costs. Most women donate regularly or from time to time. So if you have not yet done, done so and can, please join our fabulous financial supporters and you can find how to donate on our website. There's a link. This week, we'll have our second live event after last year's Philia. And we'll connect with our sisters across the pond to share with Women's Declaration International USA the beginning of their convention on reigniting the women's liberation movement. We're going to have a radical feminist structural analysis with Lier Keith and Kathy Sarachild, facilitated by Lauren Levy. So now let's reignite the women's liberation movement. I'm handing over Kara Dansky, president of Women's Declarations International USA chapter, speaking live from Washington, DC. Kara, over to you. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to all the women in the room who have gathered in Washington, DC. Welcome to all the women all over the world who are listening to this live broadcast and all of the people who might be watching the YouTube later. Uh, this is an exhilarating event. We're having a wonderful time here in Washington. The weather couldn't be more beautiful. I want to hand it over to Lauren Levy, who's going to be facilitating this amazing panel. Thank you to all of WDI. Thank you, Kara. And welcome everyone to Radical Feminist Structural Analysis Plenary Panel. I suggested doing a plenary panel on Radical Feminist Structural Analysis because it is this analysis of patriarchal systems that has the power to make a bunch of unhappy women with individual complaints about men into a revolutionary political force with reality reality-tested ideals, theories, and actions. Kathy Sarachild will be our first, uh, our first panelist. She has been a member of the group Red Stockings for more than 50 years, and it was Kathy who began using the term radical feminist in 1968. Red Stockings women would go on to champion and spread knowledge of vital women's liberation theory, slogans, and actions that have become household phrases, including consciousness raising, the personal is political, sisterhood is powerful, the politics of housework, the iconic 1968 Miss America protest, and speak outs that would break the taboos of silence around subjects like abortion. Kathy Sarachild once wrote, our feelings will lead us to our theory, our theory to our action, our feelings about that action to new theory and then to new action. I'm really glad to be here again and thank the organizers and thank you all for coming. I just want to say that there's a little bit of, I, maybe I have a little hard of hearing and I may have heard wrong, but I didn't do all those things that she, <laughs> that Lauren said I did. Uh, a lot of that was red stockings, not me. But I will just say one thing about the term radical feminist, which I believe I was the first to use publicly. And the only, uh, and that was in, in 1968, the only reason I, I care, well, one of the reasons anyway, I care to say that is that if you, you can actually go and see the place where it was used uh, online, it was in my program for, conscious, for consciousness raising. And if you will go there and look, you'll see how it was used. And I think you'll see that it was used very intersectionally. I say radical feminism, with radical feminism, we will 
not only learn how women are oppressed specifically, or that radical feminism is that, but they will we'll learn how the other things too, racism, uh, class oppression, working class oppression, uh, will impact the oppression of women and will be able to unite better when we know that. So it, if from the beginning, if people check out the original sources, that was my intention anyway, there were other people used the term also um, a little later, although T. Grace Atkinson has said that she used it first in another document that she didn't put in her book, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, and she might be right, but I wish she'd put the document in her book because I love looking at these documents. Okay, uh, structure can mean so many things in a radical feminist context. The structure or structures of what women are up against, up against in society and perhaps even nature, that's true, you know, that in some ways, the structures of what women are fighting for, our goals, the structures of our struggle for our goals and our struggles, including uh, the structures, uh, structuring the struggles priorities. So st it's stimulating st to think about breaking down uh, this idea of structure because isn't that what an, breaking down isn't that what analysis is all about analysis is all about breaking things down into their parts the parts of how we could think about structure breaking down concepts breaking down the reality around us so we can see things better understand it and create tools for helping us to serve and prosper in it to service and pro prosper in it Stimulating to, th stimulating to think about all these things, but it's also a big job. There is also the structure of working on a job like this. Is the structure of the movement now sufficient to support a job like this, of cre creating ongoing structural analysis? And if it's not, one job that's needed uh, the job that's needed is what can we do to support more of this? Support it on a continuous basis because we're going to have to keep doing it as we learn more and more from the fight, as we learn more and more from our fight, what we're up against and where we can or can't go. Well, thank you for inviting me in on a new step along this way even though I'm rusty. And this shouldn't be that I'm so rusty. But that's another thing. That's part of our structural problems, I think. <laughs> One more thing I want to say before I get into what I prepared. We've learned in this struggle against the trans reaction against feminism that we're up against structures that have the power to control language our very means of communication. We've learned even more about this after many decades. We're up against uh, owners, the controllers, owners, because that's who the controllers are, the owners of the means of mass communication. How very strong, they're very strong and can get crazy nasty. This trans thing seems crazy nasty. But all along in this struggle, we've been learning that we have less power than we think, but also more than we know. In those movements where we've been able to unite, we've learned we have tremendous power at times, especially if we can keep our unity a little more durable than we have. Radical, what, it, what does it really mean? And I don't just mean that it comes from the Latin word for root and means getting to the root. That's important. No, so few people know that. And it's been said already, I think, in our movement. Feminist, the word feminist and feminism also happened in the world labor movement 
that there came to be a zillion socialisms. Even the, the Communist Manifesto talks about that. It has a whole list in it of the different kinds of socialisms. And even then, and in the preface to the Communist Manifesto, Engels explains why they use the word communist and not socialist when there were all these other uh, socialisms around. And if you read it, uh, don't believe me, but if you read it, you'll see that it was basically defined as we communists. It wasn't about violence. It wasn't about the overthrow of the government. It was really about similar to our independent women's liberation movement. He says, unlike so many of the socialists that look to the upper class to help the workers, and that was their struggle, and that was their strategy. We believe that the, the working class can only be emancipated, and that's what socialism meant, the emancipation of the working class. It wasn't some ideal form out there. It was the workers have to learn themselves by trying how the working class is going to get emancipated. That's right in the introduction, uh, the preface, a later preface for why they called themselves communists instead of these other kinds of socialists. Read the original sources. Really, there's so much bullshit out there. Now, what about the zillion feminisms? And now I thank Brooke Williams. I think Brooke Williams' definition who wrote many good articles in the journal Off Our Backs. And I'm proud to say there's a very good article by her in the Red Stockings book, Feminist Revolution. Her definition, I think, of feminism is the best. She says, feminism is its history. And there may be many developments, many twists and turns, but feminism and many feminisms but feminism has only one history. And we can, if we can understand the history, we can see how these different, different so-called feminisms arose through the history and how one thing differs from the other and why, what the arguments were. This same point applies to the term radical feminism. Radical feminism is its history. There have been many differences and developments in radical feminism, but all that makes one history. I also want to remind people of the issue that I know T. Grace Atkinson raised, but maybe her whole group did too, the group, the feminists. Back then in the late 60s, there were quite a number of radical feminist groups. T. Grace uh, once explained that the group her group, the feminists, didn't like the term radical feminist because it was, a, it was redundant, insulting. Of course, feminist, feminism was radical and real radicalism had to be feminist. Here is an effort at some radical feminist structural analysis related to the interplay between human biology and the social structures human beings devise to keep, to help them survive and thrive. Because that's really the origin of social structures. It seems, I, I find that plausible anyway. By the way, recognizing biological realities does not mean that humans are unable sometimes to surmount the biological realities in a sense. We seem to have done so with reading glasses, electricity, refrigerators, contraception, and many others, for example. But humanity has made many terrible mistakes in the past when we thought we were surmounting nature. Ecological mistakes, for, for instance, as we're, be we're beginning to know so well, leading to at least several near extinction experiences. You can see that in the genes. Our genes are so thin. That means there were times when we practically had to start all over again from a very few people. Each time the gene pool gets smaller and smaller, and which makes it harder and harder to deal with the next time that happens. 
the dialectical principle so eloquently expressed by Francis Bacon, father of the scientific revolution in the 1700s, can't be forgotten or there is a heavy price to pay. He said, quote, nature can be mastered only by being obeyed. The basic radical and yes, root premise of feminism, it seems to me anyway, is also the root premise of the US Declaration of Independence. If the declaration is modified to say, quote, all human beings, are born equal instead of, quote, all men. So yes, the declaration is right in saying that human beings are born with equally capable and basically equi equivalent mental equipment. However, our equal mental equipment is highly limited at birth. The human's brain is extremely undeveloped uh, at birth, much more so than other advanced animals. And as a result, all human infants are much more dependent on adult care, protection and training for an unusually long time. This has long been part of the biological reality of humans, as yet basically unmod unmodified by technical advances except of course the amount of care labor required by an adult or older child has been considerably reduced by technological advances. From the warmth from the discovery of fire to baby formula. For various reasons of human logic and an efficient division of labor, it has made sense in human societies, at least for the earliest childcare, to be done by the mother if the mother is available, especially if the mother is nursing. By the way, the reason as I understand it, that our common human brain is so undeveloped at birth is that our brains when they are developed are so large that if the brain was more fully developed at birth, it would kill the mother. The biological reality that for human infants to survive and develop into full use of their adult brain power, for that to happen, they need a, rel uh, the, a, re they need a relatively long period of care and training by other sufficiently developed human beings has been a major logical reason of efficiency for a division of labor according to sex. It seems plausible that the biological realities needed for protecting and developing the amazing brain shared by humans of both sexes is one of, uh, okay, I'm repeating that, sorry. Okay, this is not about any hypothesis of quote, maternal instinct, but about human beings equally making decisions about what's needed and logical divisions of labor. That's plausible. I'm not gonna get into the reason why I think that, well, all right, I'll say it. <laughs> the reason I think it was plausible that it could have been equally decided back in the beginning of the time, something I didn't used to believe. I used to believe that women had to be forced into childbirth. I guess I'm probably gonna repeat that, but anyway. But the reason, and this I don't repeat. I first read by, in the, in, Stanton and Anthony's History of Women's Suffrage, a quote from an, a feminist of the late 19th century. And they, this came up because of the Civil War, when the men had fought such a, had to fight, you know, and die in such numbers and everything. It raised people's consciousness about war a lot. And um, this feminist, I don't remember her name right now, but I've said this in other things that I haven't yet put on the Red Stockings website, but anyway, she said that it happened that the, uh, the sexual division of labor happened because the tribe, any tribe, simply could not survive if too many of the women were killed. 
So actually, it wasn't that men were stronger, that they became the defenders and hunters and warriors. It was because the tribe decided they were more expendable. It makes sense, you know. But we can clap. But, you know, my mother told me, and also a, I was a friend of Tilly Olson, the short story writer whose work some of you might know. She said the same thing. That they think that the reason feminism, one reason feminism died down a lot after World War II was that the men had had such a hard time in the war that the women felt guilty about it. Um, so it's, it's real, the, this question of war and men being expendable. We actually, that was a fair division of labor because women died in childbirth and men died in dangerous other things, you know. And anyway, that seems plausible to me, very plausible, that it could have been equally decided in the beginning. And one of the big questions is, how did it become unequal and why? And there's been a lot written about that, and that doesn't seem so clear to me. So I won't go, try to go into that. Um, by the way, one piece of evidence for how brilliant human beings are is that the language ability of every normal human just demonstrates genius-like features. I believe it is Noam Chomsky who has been eloquent in pointing this out, explaining the intellectual brilliance behind all human language acquisition with what it can describe, what it can convey, cause and effect, action and reaction, description. And this brilliance is shown in all human languages all over the world. There's no like some are more developed than others with human language. Back to the human in its infancy, in early childhood needs a great amount of care as her or his brain is development, uh, developing. Another maternal material reality, highly relevant to radical feminist understanding is that no human, no human being at any age can survive alone for very long. All human beings need a group to survive and to achieve something of a comfortable life, protected from the worst of the elements in addition to dangers from nature and other humans. Furthermore, no individual or group of individuals can live forever. All humans in the group grow steadily older, steadily gaining valuable knowledge, but also infirmities of various kinds as they move inex inexorably toward the grim reaper. As all individuals die and in various age cohorts, so the group that each needs for survival and comfort needs to be replenished. And as people in the group are born, develop, and die at different times, the group needs to have people at different ages in it for the maximum survival, comfort, and happiness for all. This need for the continuous replenishment of the group for survival is why the group, in the common interest of all, needs to work out systems, rules, and structures for ensuring sufficient procreation. In the rebirth years of what, we'd, uh, what we've agreed for the time to call the fe second feminist wave, I, with my college degree, didn't understand any of this. And I didn't see anybody around me who seemed to. I thought that women have to be forced to have children because why else would we accede to such a painful and dangerous task? I didn't understand any of these simple logical points that I've just described and that nobody has to be a rocket science to figure out. Really, we could figure this out just looking. I mean, it's hard. There are all kinds of thinking outside the box problems we have, but you don't have to go to college to figure this out. You just have to have a reason to think about it and a need to think about it. Okay, and I didn't see, see anybody around me who seemed to. 
there were feminist comrades around who would say things like, because of the problem of overpopulation at this point, it was no longer necessary for women to have as many children as they used to need to, to, need to do, or even have any. It has become simply an individual choice. As someone thinking of herself as a radical feminist, I didn't agree that some women simply liked the idea of having children and chose it in that way, for that reason only. I thought that if we achieve freedom for all women to choose not to have children, which of course was our radical goal because we wanted all women equally free, if women were really free of the social, political, and economic inducements and pressures to have children, many fewer, if any women, would choose the dangers and other demands of having children. And that might be a problem. In fact, T. Grace Atkinson asked this question in one of her early papers that's in Notes from the Second Year. Do all women have the right not to have children? She didn't go on to say things that stuck with me to explain it, but that really stuck with me. Now, I feel embarrassed to say it, but my memory is that I wasn't alone in failing to see a personal practical importance in what, uh, in what was usually a dry and far removed reference to a need, quote, to continue the species. I didn't see how it would affect my life, continuing the species. This other stuff about no group can be, can, no person can survive alone. Is, I had to come through, through the women's liberation movement experience. A simple thing like that, I had to come through to the women's liberation experience. There was no one around I can remember explaining for a while this change, any practical big picture uses or needs for having children in my own and everyone else's interests. So I was ready to be a brave radical feminist standing up to an unfair, oppressive, and sometimes even exploitative pressure for women to have children that would consequently keep them from more interesting and exciting and prestigious, and even oftentimes more leisurely lives open to many more men than women. My mother sometimes said mysterious things that I wouldn't ask her any more about, like, quote, I have a responsibility to you because you never asked to be born, unquote. But I had not even the glimmer or even suspicion that I do now about what she was getting at. I see now that probably lots of things about the birds and bees that people don't want to talk about had nothing to do with issues around the intimacies of sexual congress between the two sexes. Uh, perhaps it was my college education that got in the way, obstructing rather than helping. One paper by Marxist feminist Peggy Morton in 1970, which you can find in some of the anthologies uh, and in the Red Stockings archives, <laughs> began pursuing a radical train of analysis of the political economy, I guess you could call it, of the biology of human reproduction. This began to change by 1970, here's another credit about how it began to change, uh, by 1972 with the publication, not only of the paper I just mentioned in 1970, but by the publication of Elaine Morgan's Descent of Women, who actually writes in it about how she came to realize that there was a, an economy to having children. Um, th that book has become bad-mouthed. Uh, and I myself, when my mother told me I really needed to read it, I myself didn't like the book when I first began to read it. Uh, but it, it, it has a lot of good things in it. There is another structural reality of the biology of advantages and disadvantages of human survival that I haven't mentioned yet, that has to do not just with the known observable realities of human sexual di differentiation, which we talked about a lot as, we've as this trans thing came, 
came on. Simply, it's just real that there are males and females. There's more to it. It's also a damn good thing. Okay. But the less widely understood advantages of the kind or category of procreation, animal or plant, known as sexual reproduction, as differentiated, for instance, from kinds known as asexual or non-sexual reproduction. The big advantage, of course, and why it's considered an evolutionary advance is that you get more variation in the offspring when two different, uh, egg, uh, two different gametes come together and produce, and the greater variation, biodiversity and all that, helps people survive and helps the animals that evolve to the point of sexual reproduction survive. So it's not just the reality, it's an important reality that matters. On the environmental front, women have to be organized to defend and further develop social institutions and technical advances crucial for freeing us from unnecessary, unequal burdens of reproduction. We need to improve, maintain, and expand our feminist organizations of women for women to defend our, and advance our interests as stakeholders, not weaken and dilute them with the confusions of artificial women who really don't have the same stake. We can push for some relief and greater room in our lives. Now I'm leaving out the question of socialism, not because I believe we should, but I'm trying to get to the bare bones stuff here. We can push for some relief and greater room in our lives from new work systems and social services. We win like shorter work days and shorter work weeks without loss in pay. And as some early feminists pointed out, that sh a shorter work time on jobs structured in would mean would, would, we wouldn't have to always have 24 hour childcare centers. It would mean that the parents, that women would get more jobs because it, they'd be spread out more evenly and both would have more time for some personal childcare in addition to childcare services. The most important, I think, structural thing is building our organized bases of power. So it will be harder to lose these reforms and even these revolutionary leaps, because that's really all a revolution is. It's not perfection, it's a leap. And that's in the radical classics, by the way, that's not my invention. So it will be harder to lose these, re these reforms we fight for with our main by maintaining our power base and possible to win further advances, readying ourselves to put into place a society really free from sexism, racism, and economic inequality. Lear Keith has been a radical feminist for 40 years. She is the author of seven books, including The Vegetarian Myth, Food, Justice, and Sustainability, which has been called the most important ecological book of this generation. She is co-author with Derek Jensen and Max Wilbert of Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It. She lives in Northern California with giant trees and giant dogs. <laughs> she has been arrested six times for acts of political resistance. Lierre is a familiar and well-loved speaker to most of us involved with WDI USA and Women's Liberation Front or WOLF. Today, Lierre will, will speak about liberal versus radical feminism. What is oppression? What is women's oppression? What is political resistance? And why resistance movements need a supportive culture of resistance? We're delighted to welcome you, Leah Keith. Well, you've heard of speed dating. This is speed revolution. So this is the debt that all radicals owe to Karl Marx. And you certainly don't need to be any kind of Marxist but he is the one who chalked this out for us. Um, liberals believe that society is made up of individuals. So individualism is so sacrosanct that in this view, being identified as a member of a group or class is the insult. That's what oppression is for liberals. Now for radicals, it's totally different. 
society is made up of classes. And this was economic class in Marx's original version, but it's really any group or caste. So it's groups of people and some groups have power over other groups. In the radicals understanding, being a member of a group is not an affront, far from it. Identifying with the group is the first step toward political consciousness and ultimately effective political action. You make common cause with people who share your condition. The other big division is on the nature of social reality. So liberalism is idealist. And what that means is that society is made up of attitudes and ideas. And that means that social change happens through rational argument and education. Now materialism in contrast, that means that society is organized by concrete systems of power, not by thoughts and ideas, but material institutions. The solution to oppression is to take those systems apart brick by brick. So liberals will say, we have to educate, educate, educate. And radicals say, actually, we have to stop them. Okay, if you remove power from the equation, oppression looks either natural or voluntary, which erases the fact that it's social subordination. So this is an infamous article by one Robert Bennett Bean, who's from 1906, uh, but there's piles of others. And they're all desperate to prove, guess what? That black people are naturally inferior. So there's charts, there's pictures, it all looks really scientific, but this is the propaganda of power. For women, we have the same propaganda of power. This is Mr. Andrea Long Chu. His book, Females, A Concern, was reviewed in none other than the New York Times. So here's the quote, femaleness is a universal sex defined by self-negation. All defined as female, any psychic operation in which the self is sacrificed to make room for the desires of another. The barest essentials of femaleness are an open mouth, an expectant asshole, blank, blank eyes. Now he's saying that women's sexual subordination is the definition of being female, right? It's women's nature. So I've been canceled by all, all three of my publishers, but this utter garbage gets put in the New York Times. And in case you think that Mr. Andrea is a one-off, uh, because some men find the word woman offensive, the New York Times has decided that, quote, individuals who have receptive vaginal sex is a reasonable replacement for the word woman. This is real. <laughs> Women are passive sexual receptacles for an active male agent. This matches rather precisely how Mr. Andrea defines woman. And it is of course, the entire endless point of pornography. Or as Catherine McKinnon said once so succinctly, man fucks woman, subject, verb, object. Now you're allowed to get angry at this. You don't have to keep being nice. So before I use the word gender, I'm gonna define it. Uh, the UN says that gender is the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities appropriate for men and women. I think a lot of us are feeling that the word gender is irredeemable at this point, and maybe we should just say sex stereotypes for clarity. But regardless, race, class, caste, gender, these are politically real, right? They're brutally, viciously real. But it's the ideology of the powerful that always makes this claim for their immutable origin. So it's nature, it's evolution, it's God. It's something that very conveniently can't be questioned or changed. But from the vantage point of human rights, these are unjust systems that have to be dismantled until the categories themselves, race, class, gender, no longer have any meaning because the material conditions that create them no longer exist. What liberalism misses is that 90% of oppression is consensual. As Florence Kennedy wrote, there can be no really pervasive system of oppression without the consent of the oppressed. This does not mean that it's our fault, that the system will crumble if we withdraw personal consent or that the oppressed are responsible for their oppression. All it means is that the powerful can't stand over vast numbers of people 24 hours a day with guns. Now, luckily for them, depressingly for the rest of us, they don't have to. People withstand oppression using three psychological methods denial, accommodation, and consent. Anyone on the receiving end of domination learns early to stay in line or risk the consequences. 
And those consequences only have to be applied once in a while to be effective. The traumatized psyche will then police itself. There are entire bodies of discourse that ask the question of how the powerful get the oppressed to internalize the values of the oppressor. It's why the word hegemony was invented. But the take home point, do not ever conflate consent with liberation. Consent is accommodation to unjust conditions that we do not control. Liberation is the complete overthrow of those conditions. So oppression, uh, this is Marilyn Fry. Um, and her definition, oppression is a system of interrelated forces and barriers which reduce, immobilize, and mold people who belong to a certain group and affect their subordination to another group. So this is radicalism in one elegant sentence. Oppression is not an attitude. It's not an internal feeling state. It's about systems of power, material reality. One of the harms of subordination is that it creates not only injustice and exploitation and abuse, but also consent. So she uses the image of a bird cage. One wire will not hold that bird, but oppression is like a cage. It's a system of interrelated forces. It's all the wires working together. If you don't see that it's a system of interlocking barriers, well, that bird just wants to be in that cage. The bird enjoys being in that cage. The bird is singing, she's eating, she may even be laying eggs. The bird is volunteering to be in that cage because it's the bird's nature to be in that cage. So the interrelated, interrelated barriers create subordination. Well, what's subordination? See, all of this has already been worked out for us. And there are plenty of days when I think we have no excuse, like the heavy lifting's already been done. So here's Andrea Dworkin, four elements of subordination, hierarchy. One group on the bottom has less power and fewer rights, resources than the other group, which is on the top. Um, and so that bottom group is seen and treated as inferior. Objectification, members on the bottom group are treated as thing-like, as mere instruments for others' use, um, as commodities or as property. Submission, the bottom group typically complies with the wishes, the self-defined needs of the top group. Doing so is essential for their survival, and it's then of course used as proof of their inferiority. So it's this feedback loop. This is the situation the oppressed always face. Rock, hard place. If you submit, then you are subordinated and that's the harm. But if you resist, you are punished until you are either dead or until you submit and then you are subordinated. There's no way out, not as individuals. There are no personal solutions to social subordination. The only solution is organized political resistance. And finally, violence. Committed by members of the top group against members of the bottom group, it's routine, systematic, seen as right, necessary, inevitable, and of course, natural. Now, you can take all of this and apply it anywhere. Liberal, radical, oppression, resistance. This being a feminist event, I'm gonna apply it to women which is how radical feminism was created. Women took the tools of political analysis learned on the left and applied them to our own lives. Teach slaves to read, eventually they revolt. Eventually they write their own political theory. Without feminism, each woman is cut adrift in a hostile chaotic sea. Apply the word sex class and that chaos snaps into a sharp, subordination, a sharp pattern of subordination from the small daily insults to body and soul, to the shattering traumas of incest and rape, the crimes men commit against women aren't done to women as individuals. They're done because women belong to a subordinate class and they're done to keep us a subordinate class. And this is what feminists began to see. The central elements of subordination, the hierarchy, the objectification, the violence, they were happening to women but mostly in the realm called private, done by men who claim to love us through actions that men experienced as sex. That's the core insight of radical feminism. Now, liberal feminists take the model of how men are oppressed and apply it to women. Liberal feminism tends to follow the civil rights movement and other male struggles. Uh, so what are all the ways that a group of people is barred from full participation in public life? employment, education, law, 
and then you address those barriers, right? That needs to happen. I'm glad I have a checking account. I'm glad I have a credit card. I'm glad I can own a house. I'm glad I can marry a woman if I want to. All of that needed to happen. But putting women at the center of the analysis yields something different. Women's oppression is not at heart about barriers to public life. It's about how the entire private realm is in fact political. Rape, battering, incest, prostitution, and murder create a barricade of sexual terrorism. Keeping women out of civic life is really about keeping us dependent on our private owners. No leftist analysis has ever included the realities of women's lives. Indeed, the left has delivered us up to all men collectively. And that was one of Dworkin's major insights. The only difference between left and right is that the left wants women to be public property instead of private. If one woman told the truth about her life, wrote poet Muriel Rukeyser, the world would split open. Well, we did by the hundreds and then the thousands. And then we started counting. The numbers are a trauma all their own. Battering, for instance, in the United States, a man beats up a woman every nine seconds. One third of battering starts when a woman is pregnant and male violence, a man's willful fist or foot is the number one cause of birth defects in this country. 80,000 American children are sexually abused every year and 80% of the time, quote, a parent is the perpetrator. Sisters, you know it's not their moms. One by one, men do this to the most vulnerable. Children are so easy to control and even easier to hurt. The small bones break, the fragile tissues tear, the fledgling self splinters from its only body. 80,000 times the world should stop spinning and it doesn't, and I don't know why. Globally, all of that happens and more. There are 60 million child brides, 200 million survivors of FGM, 126 million girls aborted for being female. This is why we call it a war. If these numbers aren't just background noise, the inevitable, unremarkable actions of everyday men taking what is theirs, but actual crimes done to human beings. If women are political subjects with inalienable rights, then there is a word for harm at this scale. War fits, but men scoff when we say it. Fine, but I would like to know what else to call it. The first wave brought us the rights of basic citizenship, to vote, to gather and speak in public, to run for office, to own property, to get an education. Throughout the 20th century, women made advances in the professions, the trades, and in the law. In my lifetime, birth control and abortion were legalized. Women made huge strides against employment discrimination, and the silence about, about male violence was shattered. Feminists founded rape crisis hotlines and battered women's shelters, created rape shield laws, out of nothing but sheer stubborn belief in women's rights, invented the concept of sexual harassment and got it in front of the Supreme Court. And we tried to do something about prostitution. And then the internet happened. Um, I don't know if it's possible to overstate the damage it's done to our brains and to our humanity, but the age of the image is here. And that image is the female body, objectified, stripped, bruised, starved, and even dead. The backlash to feminism was bound to come. Only now the boys have a whole new arsenal with which to punish us hard, fast, and publicly. Number one, internet search term. Number one, teen porn. 324 million hits, torture porn. Their hunger for this is bottomless. I was born in 1964. I remember the world before pornography took over. Yeah, it was there, but it wasn't everywhere. In my lifetime, I have watched as men have created a whole new regime of degrading and dangerous sex acts enacted without remorse on the bodies of women and girls, and then normalized into just regular sex. To the women who are younger than I, I am sorry. If it's any consolation, some of us saw it coming and we tried, but it was like trying to stop a tsunami. I'm not giving up, but we are facing a monster and he is legion because he is every man and he is everywhere. 
Sadism's only end game is necrophilia. And here we are. But for women and for the planet, he's choking her out too. He's fucking the planet to death. Okay, I've seen this, not in Mongolia, but where I live. I live in a temperate rainforest in Northern California. It doesn't burn. But the fires in California were so bad, the sky was orange for two days. It was like fog. I couldn't see my hand. It was a hellscape. Sadism ends at necrophilia. He won't stop until every living creature has been punished. We are going to have to take the system apart. His economics, his religion, his psychology, and most of all, his sex. The feminist movement has managed to get women a whole bunch of options for getting away from violent men, but what no one has been able to do is get men to stop. That barricade of sexual terrorism is what, what never changes, and now it's getting worse. So we are going to have to do it somehow, brick by brick, not accommodate to it, not make the best decision we can inside it, but take it down. This is what radical feminists know. No one wants to hear it, but it's true. The male erotic trinity, sex, violence, and death reigns supreme. Andrea tried to tell us this was the world she had learned through the childhood molestation, the battering, and the rapes, all the rapes. Men tell us who they are, believe them. When bison are under attack, they pack into a tight circle. Protected at the center are the mothers and babies. Next are the older calves, weaned and vulnerable. A defensive ring of cows without young comes next. And finally, facing out, stand the bulls. We are under attack. Every last creature is under threat. He has leveled mountains, believe him. If we all make that tight circle, with mothers and babies of every species at the center, protected until the last, and plant our feet firmly on our still living earth, we can face him down. He has the rancid thrills of sadism and the sterile dreams of machines. We have love and our animal bodies and the stalwart light of every dawn. Don't let him win. Five words to live by. Thank you. Can Lier please address the tension between everybody's need for certain areas of individuality it, within a context of, of working um, on a structural level and a political level? That, that is a very real tension. So it's a necessary but a critical embrace of our group status, because without it, we're never going to be free. Um, but it's also true that at the end of the day, the entire point is that we want to be individuals, right? I mean, that's the famous quote from Martin Luther King, that he wants his four children to be judged by the content of their character, not as somebody with black skin. You know, it's like, we actually want that to be free. Um, the problem is that claiming it now doesn't get us there, that, you know, we do have to participate in some kind of group-based activity, you know, that's, that's where our power is, is as a group. Um, and we have to, to, ana to analyze our situation, you know, you have to come to that understanding that men don't do this to, as, to us as individuals, they do it to us because we belong to this class called women. So it's both, I mean, it is absolutely, it's a very necessary step, but it's a very, it's, we always have to be critical of it as well because we are more than what they've done to us. I mean, that really is the point. Right? And we do want to be free of this someday. So we're always, I think, riding that line between those two things. Um, so, I mean, you're right to point that out, that that is a real tension. And I'm sure that that is quite real. Okay, my point really is we have much less individualism or much less right to be individuals than we think. I mean, just think about it. We're already in groups, all these structures around us. And the article telling, you know, telling us what we better do. Uh, and that's the negative. There's also the positive of the structures, which feed us, you know, uh, essential laborers, let's say, you know, with, without, anyway. But the thing in feminist revolution 
that specific kind of is a, is somewhat about this. And I can't remember the name of it, but it's uh, by Elizabeth Most, uh, who is about 30 years older than the rest of us. <laughs> she talks about this myth people have about that the people at the top are all individuals and talks about how collectively they work. Mm -hmm. I mean, just take the New Yorker, for instance. It's highly edited. Writers don't just get, to get that New Yorker brand, they have a slew of editors highly editing the writing that people make to create that uniform classic brand. And so in our women's liberation, I want the right to say it my way when maybe another way is the messaging would be more effective. We have to be able to get into a give and take about that. And actually there probably should be some final decision makers who know more from experience about what messaging is really more effective to get what we want. And that's a collective way of operating. And that's how actually the power structure operates. How lawsuits, how, how using lawsuits can, um, can help us. So I'm going to quote Catherine McKinnon, law organizes power. So we need to reorganize that power so that we all have it. And it's not just one small group of people that has it. And this is why I love encouraging women to go to law school. We are always at a disadvantage because we are operating under the U.S. Constitution, which was not written for us. And what has been added to that that has helped us is really stuck on with spit in a prayer. So we don't have the best framework to get to women's equality with the document as it stands. And people in this country, for whatever reason, seem incredibly resistant to rewriting the Constitution, which is rather bizarre because most Western democracies on the regular rewrite their constitutions. I mean, in my lifetime, Canada has done it. And it was a really interesting process to watch them do it. And they came up with something way better than what we have here. Um, so there's a lot of problems with, there are some very good things about our constitution. Most people, when they think about the constitution, it's just the bill of rights that they think about. And I have honestly, in the last decade, really come to appreciate that first amendment, like really come to appreciate that in a way I never did before, you know, the crazy took over the left. Um, but the idea that we have a right to gather in public, um, to petition our government with our grievances, to be heard in some way that's socially meaningful. I took all of that for granted growing up in America. Uh, that was a mistake because now the left is taking it from us. So those are the things we need to remember and protect as sort of our, you know, it's been called our, our civic religion in America um, is that bill of rights. And those are important rights, but none of them go far enough is the problem. Okay, now we're gonna get technical. They're mostly what are called negative freedoms. So it's a series of things the government's not allowed to interfere with which doesn't really help us. That if you are another powerful white man, that helps you because the only people against you is the government. The problem is there's all these other, you know, that sort of swarming mass of us underneath all of them. And the government is not the only thing that's coming at us. It's often, if you're a woman, it's other men, you know, and there's nothing in there that helps us. So really, I mean, if you wanna, if we're gonna start from ground zero, we need a new constitution. And I have actually read the constitutions of other countries and some of them are really interesting. Like we could be doing a lot more than we're doing, but it's an uphill struggle because like I said, for whatever reason, people in this country, we, we don't think we can. And I don't really get it because this country was founded on saying, hey, we're gonna do this. Like we're not actually, actually gonna be citizens of Britain anymore. We're gonna do this other thing. And here's a constitution. What are you gonna do about it? Um, so why can't we rewrite it? I mean, I don't, like, why is everybody so attached to it? I just, I don't quite understand how we got here. I think that there, there are several things um, that have to happen at once in order to create a revolution. One is, um, one is on the legal front. Um, we need to bring lawsuits and, and lawsuits are, lawsuits are um, we're good at that in the United States. Uh, we, we have open courts in the United States. Uh, the norm is not for the losing party to pay fees. So the courts are open. There's not a huge penalty for losing a lawsuit. That means you can sue. Um, there are other costs, but we need to bring lawsuits. Absolutely, we need to bring lawsuits. Um, the, sec the second thing is that we need to organize. We need grassroots organizing and we need grassroots ac actions. Uh, we need to be in the streets. Um, and we need to be in the streets strategically 
and in a disciplined fashion. Yeah. And the third thing that we need, in my opinion, is just off the top of my head, I could be leaving something out, um, is advocacy, political advocacy, uh, where we, uh, we, we go behind the scenes or in front of the scenes and we talk to legislators, people who make the laws, um, people who can, um, can uh, make new, new bills um, and, and write new bills and write them our way. Uh, so I, I see those, those three things. What do you think about the state? We need a state to protect us from male violence, and we know it is more than often a vehicle of male supremacy. I'm not sure it's that useful a concept anymore. It was great in the beginning when we know about, you know, how, how there was force involved in women's oppression and all that. I mean, military force, physical force, not just economic force. But if you look at it, I mean, it is true that most um, that nine, 100, almost 100 percent of violence is comes from men, but the fact is there's enormous variation in male violence. The United States is one of the societies in which male violence is very, very high. The USA, that much higher than in a lot of like Western European countries. I don't know about all of them, but that uh, we've looked into that. So obviously there are other factors at work. It's not just maleness. It's, you know, that degree of male violence that we in the United States are especially facing. An another uh, fact uh, is that studies have shown that when unemployment rises, male violence rises. It's just, it always happens. It rises a lot. So unemployment has a lot to do with male violence. If we eliminating male violence, I mean, is, is a big thing. I mean, that's a very big thing. That's our ultimate goal. I mean, uh, trying to eliminate the correlation between males and violence because there is such a correlation. But we obviously can see that progress can be made because of this huge variation. And in the meantime, wouldn't as women who care about the lives of women ha be happy to reduce male violence? Well, if we want to reduce male violence, maybe we should work on the unemployment situation and what's causing so much unemployment and what's causing the United States to be the number one, the biggest purveyor of violence in the world militarily as Martin Luther King said, the United States is, not all countries. And what's causing so many people in prison more than any other country in the world? So we have to look at what's going on in the United States as much as what's going on with men, really, because there are these variations and we are among the most violent countries in many ways, if we care about violence. 